In the last days of his life, Albert Einstein remained vexed by a problem he had devoted so much of his life to. How to reconcile his theory of general relativity with the emerging field of quantum mechanics. This problem still blows cosmologists' mind, even to this day. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. General relativity tells us how the presence of matter curves and warps space-time, changing the trajectories of massive objects like planets and altering the experience of time itself. This theory, our most successful in all of physics, has given us the best descriptions of large-scale motion. But as we shrink down to size scales below the size of atoms, we start to see problems emerging. Some of the most vexing problems come from the infinite energies that emerge at the infinitesimal short ranges at subatomic scales. Some emerge from how general relativity changes the results of quantum mechanics with the bending of space-time. To illustrate how this happens, imagine space-time as a flat trampoline pulled taut with massive objects on it. The objects, viewed from above, act in very predictable paths. If we let the trampoline surface change, we start to see the objects deflecting, rolling in ways we wouldn't normally expect. The surface itself is deformed, and the actors, the particles, the massive planets themselves, are affected. The trampoline is still the same, but its shape has changed. We call this transformation, in terms of the shape of space, a diffeomorphism, and we call the invariance of it diffeomorphism invariance. But the objects are not independent of the background they're on. Trying to do quantum mechanics on a dynamically changing space-time is like trying to draw a picture on a piece of paper as it flutters in the wind. In an esoteric sense, quantum mechanical fields can become self-interacting when the background itself is changing. General relativity describes space-time and how it deforms. Quantum mechanics tells the story of the objects acting upon it. Our understanding of each of them independently is great, but putting them together reveals fundamental disagreements. Some of these disagreements are so violent, it's impossible to make any prediction. For many years, theorists tried to work with background-dependent models of the universe. But what if the background itself could be redefined in a way such that it gave us our independence, diffeomorphism invariance back? Ironically, this modern question is actually quite ancient. Sometime around the 5th century BCE, Greek and Indian scholars proposed that matter was not continuous, but gritty and indivisible at the smallest level. The idea was championed by Canada and the Greek philosopher Democritus. Today, we have robust evidence and models of atoms and even subatomic particles from the proton and neutron down to the quark level. It's natural to wonder if a parallel phenomenon exists for space and time and space-time itself. If so, there could be a smallest interval, a smallest length, and a smallest time. We call this process of chopping up space into tiny pieces quantization, exactly as we do with matter itself. By dividing up or pixelating space-time, depending on the dimension of the underlying space itself, we see that space itself could be quantized, whether in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, or any arbitrary number of dimensions you would choose. The secrets of chemistry were explained with the quantization of matter. In the same way, perhaps the secrets of physics, quantum mechanics, the subatomic scale, could be explained by quantizing space-time. If so, it could remove the infinities and unpredictable behavior at the quantum scale that general relativity introduces, as well as other issues in physics that have gone unresolved for almost a century. Establishing a fundamental minimum distance scale was the goal of early loop quantum gravity physicists. The first step was to lay the groundwork of the theory, choosing an advantageous variable set and finding new ways to describe the universe. Theoretical physicist Lee Smolin describes loop quantum gravity as a theory of quantum space-time based only on experimentally well-conformed principles of general relativity and quantum mechanics. He notes four observations that make up the backbone of the theory. The first, any theory using our understanding of general relativity must be background independent. Second, 
Our idea of the background and how it dynamically changes should be consistently true when we reach the very smallest world of quantum mechanics. The last two observations are related to how we use the field theories themselves. They're important for making sure there is no universal proper time coupled quantum fields that muddy the math or extra dimensions that we don't observe. Together, these observations inform the quantized nature of space-time. The earliest breakthroughs of the theory involve special solutions of the Wheeler-DeWitt field equation, fitted with Ashtakar variables. I know that's a mouthful, but this is where we get our loops. They're the solutions of a field theory with these special variables. Solutions of the Wheeler-DeWitt equations allow you to describe quantum phenomena with gravity present. The solutions are parallel transported connections that describe curvature in spacetime more abstractly. Properties of spacetime can be depicted as functions on a space of loops. This stitchwork pattern can be the mathematical basis for the nature of spacetime, and quantum gravity springs from the interaction of the loops themselves. From this point, physicists like Carlo Rovelli spent several years trying to tighten up the math. In the mid-1990s, constructs of loops were chained together, creating something called a spin network. The spin network describes the geometry of space. The loops and nodes move to represent ticks of time. And when energy or mass is present, integration over the affected loops gives us the properties of quantum gravity that we're looking for. There are several benefits of loop quantum gravity compared to other theories of quantum gravity. We don't have to assume that physical objects like strings or extra dimensions exist. We don't have to prove the symmetries or compactified dimensions that string theory or other theories introduce. And we can still solve the most important problems, such as describing the entropy as formulated by the Bekenstein-Hawking formula without adding new assumptions to the math. One last benefit is now there is a lower limit on the length of the universe which restricts the frequency of electromagnetic waves, making infinitely high frequencies impossible. So we're all done, right? Loop quantum gravity has so much promise, it must be the exact solution. Well, it has a lot of promise, but it has some glaring issues as well. It doesn't answer some questions about what the masses of the elementary particles are. It doesn't provide much insight on the discrepancies of quantum mechanics by itself. For this reason, it might only be the seed of a so-called theory of everything that has yet to fully sprout. Another concern many physicists have with loop quantum gravity is that it makes predictions about the velocity of photons being dependent on frequency and perhaps even on the polarization of photons. Light from a very distant object called a gamma ray burst produces photons say two of which come towards the Earth at the same moment. By looking for slight variations between the arrival time from two different photons with two different frequencies, we can test for the fundamental granularity of spacetime inherent in loop quantum gravity. NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope detected two photons from the same source nine-tenths of a second apart in 2009. This experiment was a significant blow to theories of loop quantum gravity because over such a massive time scale, the photons traveled to the same speed within one part in 100 million billion. It's possible that another experiment, one perhaps testing the polarization of light instead, could reveal some evidence for loop quantum gravity. For now, many theorists find this frequency discrepancy's failure to be revealed as a blow against loop quantum gravity. Remember back when Michio Kaku, author of The God Equation and a huge proponent of string theory, had this to say about loop quantum gravity? Well, the problem is that gravity is based on smooth surfaces. Smooth, elegant, beautiful, gorgeous manifolds. While matter is based on chopped up particles that you grind up and spit out like a meat grinder, it's all cut up. And so loop quantum gravity, which in which field does it fall into? It falls into the gravity field, but says nothing about electrons, protons, quarks, mesons, the hundreds of scientists, the hundreds of particles that we have analyzed, nothing about it. It's a theory of pure gravity. And therefore, it is simply not a unified field theory, which even the creators of the theory acknowledge. They'd be the first ones to say that their theory is not a rival to string theory. It's just an alternative, an alternative for gravity, but not for electrons, protons, quarks, you and me, basically. Finding a way to merge general relativity and quantum mechanics is still an urgent and pressing matter to this very day. Loop quantum gravity attempts to merge them both in a background independent way, and is therefore very virtuous. 
If loop quantum gravity can reconcile the various lacuna that theoretical physicists see in it and pass fundamental physical tests in observations of distant cosmological objects, perhaps someday it could be found to be not only a theory of quantum gravity, but maybe even a theory of everything. I'm Brian Keating, and this is Into the Impossible.